Okay. Well, um, dear viewers, today I have to conduct an interview or a conversation in English as my guest is professor in law, pro professor of law, Amos Giora, who just finished. You just finished yes, writing I have. this book? Yes, it yeah. came the out crime. just in April. Okay, The Crime of Complicity, with an intriguing subtitle, The Bystander in the Holocaust. I thought it had the original title, The Role of the Bystander. It did. It it did. did. The title changed over the course of time. All right, all right. Because I like the, the role, the idea of the role of the right. bystander. It makes it more active. So, so, the for me, what was important in the book was really to address the question of the bystander. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, I have to tell the viewers that um, you didn't write this book in a sort of detached uh, <coughs> psychological way. You're involved. Yes. But what did you, if you tell it in your sure. own Sure. Um, I asked myself a few years ago when my father became ill and was dying, I said, what's the best way to honor my father? And I'm a person of, I don't have hobbies, you know, I don't do woodcrafting, I don't do carpentry, I don't collect stamps, I don't build, I don't paint. I know to do two things. One is to write, and the other is to run, right? Um, and I thought that the best way to honor my father, again, as he was dying, was to write a book. And then I said, okay, what do I write a book about? By the way, I have to tell here that you're Israeli or you're Jewish? You're right. American? Yeah. I'm a dual citizen Israeli-American. Yeah. Uh, born in Israel, raised in the, in the States, and today I live in Israel but teach in the United States. Both of my parents are Holocaust survivors, and I decided that um, the time has come to explore who I am in terms of the Holocaust. But one doesn't get to that out of the clear blue sky. While I was training for the Salt Lake City Marathon, I told you I was a runner, um, my running partner, who's not Jewish, when we were running, and you know, when you train for a marathon, you have nothing to do but to kill miles and to kill hours, right? Um, we were running one day, and she said to me, I mean, out of the blue, right? She said, um, how did this happen, this being the Holocaust? And I said, you know, I don't know. And, and the reason I said I don't know is that even though both of my parents are Holocaust survivors, I was raised in a home where the Holocaust was never discussed. You're not unique in that. Uh, That's right. Uh, when I was 12 years old, my father took me canoeing and said, in one minute I'll tell you my story, and in one minute I'll tell you your mother's story. And this is the first and last time we'll ever have this conversation. I was an only child, am an only child. I came home. I had no one to so, talk But <clears throat> Let me imagine the situation. Your father was sitting at the back, so you couldn't face your father when he was saying this. No, he was probably in the front. He was in the front. He probably did one of these, right? <laughs> Pretty interesting, right? And um, I came home, I had no one to talk to but the family dog, and I said, hey, you know, this is the story. Um, and that literally was the last time we talked about it. When I was in college, I wrote my honors thesis about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and I remember telling my parents that I'm writing an honors thesis about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and I think their collective response was, oh, okay. Um, and then when our, um, we have three children, when our first child was born, I said to my father, and I need to put in parentheses, my father was a very distinguished academic with extraordinary writing skills in different languages. And I said to my dad, I said, you know, you don't, not about me, but maybe for the grandchildren, you should like tell them your story, the Holocaust story. So I get a one paragraph uh, from him and I returned it to him. I said, you know, that's an F. And then I get a second draft, <laughs> two paragraphs long. I that was a D. I returned that to him, and I realized that he was... He took it in good humor. Well, not really, because no. he had no interest in um, um, sharing with me or um, his grandchildren. But anyway, he was a Holocaust survivor. Both of your parents are Holocaust survivors. But they differ in their individual histories. They were both from Hungary. Both from Hungary. My my mother is my mother's experiences in Budapest are the exact replica duplicate of Anne Frank here in the Netherlands. My mother was in hiding in the attic with her mother, with my grandmother. Um, they went into hiding as soon as the Nazis came to Budapest in March of 1944. Um, like Anne Frank, they were outed by one of the neighbors. Um, but in parentheses, I also need to add they were fed every day by an elderly Catholic woman who brought them food. 
and then they were outed by one of the neighbors. They were uh, taken to the court. They lived in a third floor or fourth floor of an apartment building, and they were taken to be shot. Um, and at the not transported to one we'll, of the we'll, get, we'll get there. Sorry. They were um, taken to be shot, um, and at the last moment, Jewish. Uh, partisans who had stolen uniforms of the Aero Cross, who were the Nazi collaborators in Hungary, told the real Aero Cross, leave these Jews to us. And that's how my mother and grandmother uh, were spared. And from there, they went to safe house to safe house uh, in Budapest. They went to, they were outed again, taken to be shot again. And unfortunately, um, my mother won't share with us how she was saved the second time. My father, who was raised um, in a town about an hour from the Ukrainian border in Hungary. When he was 14, 15, my grandfather sent my father and my uncle to the Jewish Theological Seminary in Budapest, which was the high-end school for really super smart Jewish kids. For instance, my father's class had 12 students. 11 of them went into academia after the war. That's pretty, pretty impressive. So they survived? All, all of them all survived. Of them. Um, my father was um, sent to a camp in Serbia called Bor, which was a mining camp. This is in June of 1944. Um, and the, the Germans clearly needed the, war, the copper from the camps for the war industry, even though the war was all but over. Mm -hmm. And he was there from, January, from June 44 until November 44. And then in November 44, as the Russians were coming you know, from the east, like other camps, the Germans you know, closed the camp down. The famous death march. That's exactly right. And so the, there were 10,000 Jews in my father's camp. They were divided into two groups. The, the first group was marched back to Hungary. When they got to the Hungarian border, they were all murdered. Nobody survived. My father was in the second group, which left four days after the first group. Those four days enabled Tito's partisans to prepare an ambush. And so when they got to a particular um, spot in Serbia, the ambush took place. The partisans killed most of the German guards. And here becomes the really interesting story. There are now 5,000 Jews who, I'm not sure what the adjective is, liberated, freed. Um, now go back to when I was 12 and my father had told me, so far everything I've told you, he told me. Mm -hmm. okay? But he also told me that a Russian jeep showed up and took him, and him alone, uh, to Sofia in Bulgaria. So when you're 12 years old, you believe the stories you're told, the fables you're told, right? So I always had believed that somehow, magically, a Russian jeep showed up just for my father. Um, last year, while I was writing the book, it took me four years to research mm -hmm. and write. Um, in Budapest, I met with a Hungarian historian who took him 19 years to write the history of the camp where my father was. Um, and we met um, for coffee. He speaks no English at all, so there was a translator. And um, he's asking me, so tell me about what you know. So I told him the, the whole story, the ambush, yes, correct. And then the Jeep showed up and he said, <laughs> no, there was no Jeep at all. Um, he said, you need to know that your father you have to understand that when they're now liberated or freed right, on their own, it's the middle of the night. It's November 1944 in the middle of Serbia. Um, that my father led four other people, father men, on a 136 kilometer march from this town called Nicht or Necht in Serbia to Sofia in Bulgaria. Um, no coats, no socks, shoes, yes one shirt, one pair of pants. And it was dead cold. I mean, there was a severe wind. That's exactly right. Now, you could only walk at night because there was the Russian army here, the German army here, the villagers there. Um, I had this extraordinary relationship with my father. He really was the, 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 the greatest father and a wonderful mentor. But, but I always, always under the impression that my father couldn't make his way from where we're sitting to the door without my mom helping no him. No sense of orientation. It turns out that's not true at all. Turns out that, at this the historian told me, that the other four gentlemen who he interviewed all made it very clear that the one who led them was my dad. And again, I want to emphasize In that... Unknown territory? Unknown. 
No compass, no compass, nothing. In the middle of the night. In the middle no. of the night, in the middle, literally in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, and so there are two, he's on two death marches, one the, with the German guards and the other one with leading these four guys. In the context of the bystander, what, what, and this, the bystander has become for me, um, I think probably obsession is the, is the best word, it's the most honest word, trying to understand whether I owe you a duty and whether you owe me a duty. As I was writing the, the book, and I mentioned that he, my father was dying and he, was, he became cognitively impaired because he fell and hit his head on the sidewalk. But two years ago, out of nowhere, um, all the wires recrossed or reconnected. And for three days, for the first time in his life, I was able to talk to him about the Holocaust, about his experiences. And it's interesting, we have a glass here because this yeah. is important to the story. Yeah. The villagers would do this motion, offer them water, retract their hand. Offer water, retract their hand. Like teasing them? Um, taunting, teasing, taunting, yeah. teasing. Um, and, and they were starved and, 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 and they were clearly in distress. I mean, they were in prisoner garb, right? How cruel, and he was that, how old? 19, cruel, I mean, pick your adjective. Cruel, taunting, teasing. Yeah. Um, what was really interesting is both my, my mother and my father very much disagree with me that the bystander owes a duty because they both make the argument, I disagree with them, but that's okay, that for the um, Gentile bystander, the Gentile in, mm -hmm. in Hungary or the Gentile in Serbia, um, my mother and my father were the other. The aliens. Yes, exactly right. Um, even though my mother was- hungry. Even guilty aliens. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Um, and so when I, um, talked with my mom about my legal theory that the bystander owes a duty and is culpable if it doesn't provide assistance. Where my mother is sitting here with us today, um, she's, she lives in Israel, she's 85, she's healthier than both of us combined. She um, very much disagrees with the idea of, of, of bystander owing a duty because mm -hmm. she, mm -hmm. she believed that the bystander saw her as the other. Um, and my father in those three days um, which I wanted to record him. He didn't allow me to because he was very self-conscious about how he looked, which I thought was wrong. I thought he looked great, um, even though he was dying. Couldn't record him, couldn't film him, couldn't record him, so I was just taking notes. It was very clear that for the villager, my father was his other, the Jew, right? And did, the, did they recognize him as being Jewish, or how, how do they? They were wearing prisoner clothes. Mm -hmm. um, Didn't that make them immediately friends? Evidently not. I mean, no, anybody, anybody not. who does this motion, yeah, right? I mean, um, and so I wanted to finish the book. It was really important for me to finish it. I knew he was dying, and I wanted to finish it before he died, but unfortunately, um, mm. he died before, before I was able to finish it. But go back to how my, the, the, my running partner's question about how did this happen, so I, decided I really want to examine the bystander in the Holocaust. But I think more importantly, or just as importantly, is I, I don't like the expression, but I use the Holocaust as a trigger for asking the role of the bystander in contemporary society today. So the book is, is a personal story about my parents. Um, over the course of the four years, I researched uh, my family inside, outside, and outside, inside, and I, um, last year I, I hired a genealogist in Hungary, um, and I told him I want three things from him. A great guy. I said, I want to go to my father's hometown. I want to find my dad's house. I want to go to the Jewish cemetery, and I want to, through the genealogist, to retra retrack, retrace my grandparents' walk from their house to the train station, I want to stand on the platform, and the, from there they made their way to Auschwitz. So um, I went with him with the genealogist, and uh, we went to my father's hometown, which I'm going to mispronounce. It's called Nirohazim, which is um, an hour from the Ukrainian border. It was in the original pale of the... Uh, right, right. Yeah. and we went to the Jewish cemetery, um, and there's a huge monument to the Jews from that town who were murdered in the Holocaust. If I remember the numbers correctly, there were 7,000 Jews in this town 
either 5,000 or 7,000, five come back. It's either 7,000 and five come back or 5,000 mm-hmm, and seven mm-hmm, come mm-hmm. back. Okay. Um, one of the, there was a person waiting for me at the cemetery. And the person who was waiting for me at the cemetery is a woman my age, a little bit older, whose mother was my grandparents' neighbor. She's one of the five who comes back. And she was Jewish too. Yes. She was not a Gentile. That's yeah. right. Um, and what interested me, obsessed me, was how did the neighbors, the non-Jewish neighbors, act towards my grandparents as they were walking from house to the train station. Through this woman, I learned, based on what her mother had told her, that um, they were deported on May 26, 1944, that as they were walking to the train station, their neighbors spat at them, swore at them, hit them. them, Nobody offered any assistance. These were neighbors, right? Um, And that, for me, is the essence of the bystander. But by saying neighbors, do you imply to say that these were people, they knew them from young and they lived together? They lived they, house next to house. So they must have shared things? I don't know if they shared, but I, to what extent, it's a very interesting question. So my father, before he was sent to the theological seminary in Budapest, lived a world, a self-enclosed world of, of what we would call Eastern European Jewry, not quite the shtetl in Poland, but a self-enclosed world. My my um, great grandfather um, was the chief rabbi of Eastern Hungary. My grandfather worked in a Jewish school, uh, so it's a very very Jewish world, right? But in that in their in that neighborhood were non-Jews, and so the woman who I met at the cemetery, whose grand whose mother was deported with my grandparents. Um, made it very clear to her daughter, the woman I was speaking with, that the the neighbors, people who lived around them, on that day on May May 26th, did not offer any assistance to people who they clearly knew, and people who they clearly saw in clear distress as they were walking to the train station. It was by May 44, it was obvious what fate awaited them. Um, No assistance offered. And there's a variety of, of reasons. One is clearly historic anti-Semitism mm-hmm. in Hungary, which, by the way, is the same thing in Hungary today, right? Um, yes, in Poland. Totally, in totally, yeah. absolutely correct. Um, some people, and it's Raoul Hilberg who has written about this, the, the neighbor as beneficiary. When people are deported, there's now, there's a house, there's furniture. You know, in, in Hamburg, Germany, there were public auctions of Jewish property. Um, some of the property, by the way, which made its way from Holland to Germany was sold in auctions in Germany because somebody benefits from, from mm-hmm. the, the, the house and, the, and, the, and the, the furniture and so on. So I met with this woman um, in the cemetery, and then she was there with her husband, and I, along with the genealogist, I said that the next thing we need to do is on this huge um, um, memorial, I want to find my grandparents' name because my grandparents' name appears there. And you go by row, by row, by row, and we were able to find it. And it was, for me, an overwhelming moment. I said, you know, the Jewish Kaddish, the, the, more, the prayer for the dead, for me, it was really important, even though I'm not religious in any way, but it was really important for me to honor my grandparents. Mm-hmm. And then um, with the genealogist, we went to the um, housing office in this town, and we found the blueprints of the house, and we found the house. Um, and I took a bazillion pictures of the house. Um, and then he said to me, do you have the energy now to, re- to do the walk? And I said, no, I do not. We're not going to walk it, we'll drive it. But what was really interesting is you drive from the house to the train station, you can imagine, go back 70 odd years, and what people saw. Mm-hmm. And there's some, been, there's, there's been- What was the distance here? Was it in uh, miles or was uh, it? Five miles-ish. Five miles, all right. Yeah, five, you know what, five kilometers. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And there are clear pictures of, of, from that, of that month of May 44 of Jews carrying their bags, of Jews on their way to the train station. Um, and I said to the genealogist, I don't have the energy to walk this. Let's drive it. You were emotionally uh, <sighs> shot. Yeah. I was. Um, we got to the train station. He said, do you want to get out of the car? And I said, yes. Um, and we walked through the train station, and then um, I said, I want to go to the platform. I need to stand on the platform because I need to visualize the trains, mm-hmm. the Jews, 
and the bystanders, because there are clear pictures um, of, of trained platforms of police or guards or soldiers, arrow cross, by the bystanders, people watching, um, and the Jews getting on the trains or being pushed onto the trains. And for me, it was really essential to, to stand there and to try to, I don't like this word, but to try to feel that, that moment. And then that takes me back to um, you know, the running partner's question of how did this happen? When you, when you stand mm -hmm. on the platform, um, there's a sense of, of, again, whatever the word feeling means, of sensing, of, of trying mm -hmm. to sense mm -hmm. um, this very complicated triangle between the bystander the victim, yes, there are guards there, but there's the, the, the bystander who sees this. And does he, does he, she, it act, or does she, he not act? And um, that for me became a really critical question to address both historically and legally. And I've come to the conclusion that, that in, to, in contemporary society, right, fast forward to society today, that the bystander, he, she, it, they, who sees a person in distress. If we, you know, we mm -hmm. walk out of here and we walk down the street and somebody falls, do we owe them a duty to call, you know, alert the authorities that there's a person in distress? What I've learned from the pretty intensive research over the past four years was that indeed the bystander owes a duty, legal duty, not a moral duty, a legal duty to the victim to provide assistance, but not to intervene. I don't need you to play doctor. I need you to alert the authorities, mm. and I think that's a minimal standard that I see no reason why that can't but be imposed. But whom could they have alerted? I mean, the authorities. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. So 75 years ago, in, in or whatever, 73 years ago in, in, in Hungary, or here in Holland, the authorities were, in, were collaborating with, that's right, so there was nobody to call. But what I learned from the Holocaust, what I learned from on the Holocaust research, is the consequences of inaction. So I take that lesson learned and I apply it to society today, but you're right. Um, in Holland or in Hungary, there was no one to call because the authorities were you know, collaborating, complicit, mm -hmm. as was much of the population, absolutely. Um, I mean, not to be disrespectful, but here in Holland, the population was, was in many ways complicit with the authorities, not to be disrespectful. That's the... Well, I think relatively the most Jews were deported the from... Numbers-wise, they're the most from here. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, for a variety of complicated reasons, but it's absolutely correct. That's not to say that there were not um, people living in Holland who, you know, didn't provide assistance to Jews. That's absolutely correct. But if you look at sheer numbers, I mean, if you believe in the, in the, in the power of numbers, then yes. But what I do, try to do in the book is take the lessons learned from the Holocaust and apply it to society today where we live in normative society. I mean, if you dial the police or call the police, the police are not the enemy. The police are supposed to be, their job is to protect you, I mean, whoever the victim is. And that's why I, I, I really do believe that um, imposing a legal duty, um, making it, call it the crime of non-intervention, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. is, is for me, the most important thing that I learned over the course of the past four years. Well, in addition to learning the true story about my dad. Yeah, of right? course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, 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 let me offer you a, a Thank drink. Thank you. I mean, Thank you. <laughs> I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't know the story that well. Uh, Thank you very much. Your father. There you are. It's a moving story. And I think you. The, the <clears throat> it's a very. Uh, interesting and compelling and important uh, book, uh, important research as well. Uh, and I had a conversation the other day with, uh, with a girl, with a, with a friend of mine, about your book, about the thesis of your book. And uh, the conversation <coughs> went always. And uh, her daughter is working for a physician's Without frontiers, Frontier, physicians without borders. Physicians without borders, and she's working in Afghanistan, mm. and she tells the most horrible stories about horrible. how women are being treated. Or she is, mistreated, right? Yeah, it's mistreated. Well, pets are better off. Well, they don't have pets, but animals are better off. Right, often. right. And uh, she takes care of the uh, newborn babies, and then the, mm. uh, the, the the girl babies are well. 
And <clears throat> my reaction was, well, how can she? You, you see uh, Doctors Without uh, Borders in Sudan and in Afghanistan. And when you look at these situations, you ask yourself the question, why are they there? I mean, this, this is a barbaric society, and what are they adding to? And then <clears throat> my friend says, well, you have no choice. Interesting. I said, why? Interesting. She says, well, due to the internet and television and newspapers, you see what is happening. And as soon as you see what is happening, you're responsible. That's very interesting. And it was, I found that very interesting yes. because you put an emphasis on, say, the vicinity of the, the physica crime. The physicality. Yeah, the phys yeah. Yes. And you derive from that physicality the sense of responsibility. That's right. But it's far broader now. So it's very interesting. When I was writing the book and I gave what we in the, in the um, academy called, you know, works in progress, right? One of the questions I was asked by a colleague of mine is when I turn on CNN and I see Syria, am I a bystander? Um, and I thought that was a very interesting question, but for me, in terms of the ability to impose a legal duty, watching TV and hearing, seeing, whether it's a chemical attack in Syria or whether it's some horrible attack in Afghanistan or whatever uh, barbaric attack in, you know, go around the world. For me, from a, not as a moral, not as a moralist or ethicist, as a, but as a legalist, I really do believe that I can only impose a duty on you if there's that physicality mm -hmm, where, mm -hmm. if, again, if we're walking down the street and something, if you fall, if you're in danger. So um, th there's a story from a couple of months ago after the book came out that a woman, a mother, went into a swimming pool with her child in, in Detroit, in Michigan, and um, there was the mother, her friend, who the, the mother is in her 30s, the friend is in his 30s, and the th three-year-old child. And the three-year-old child, she's holding him, but you know how kids are, right? So the kid, okay. So the kid is now in the water, drowning, flailing in the water. Above the pool, there's a bridge. There are people standing on the bridge and they all take out their iPhones, their smartphones. What do they First do? First priority is to make pictures. That's right. They're all filming it. There's a guy standing next to the pool who does not know how to swim. Um, he's an interesting guy. He had just been released from jail. And he does not You're know You're not how to making swim. this up. I mean, the... the <laughs> not at all. He goes into the water. He saves the child. He's not able to save the other adult does not know how to swim, so the man, the man drowns. All the people here on the bridge are filming the child drowning. Not one, not one, thinks of dialing you know, 100 or 911 to alert the authorities. Those people here, for me, are clearly culpable bystanders who for me, in terms of the, the, one of the proposals in the book, or maybe the most important proposal in the book, is legislation mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. creating the crime of the bystander. Um, all those people would be clearly culpable of that. I don't need them to jump into the water. I need them to dial, you know, again, 911 whatever, or whatever, just, whatever it is, yeah. to alert the authorities and those who can't jump, like this gentleman, you know, went into the water. Um, he saved the child, tragically couldn't save the adult. You think this is the, the episode you uh, have described is typical of the of today, or does it remind you of the, the story of your father? It Ta takes me right back. Um, and I, first of all, it takes me straight back, right? In terms of how do you not provide assistance? And, and first of all, I need to put in parentheses, filming a three-year-old child drowning is, is it, pick your adjective, perverse, off, I mean, whatever adjective you want, right? Okay. Um, I included in the book two important is, um, uh, tragedies, but, which are relevant to this conversation. About 20 years ago, two 19-year-olds, a guy named David Cash and Jeremy Strohmeyer, went gambling in Las Vegas. Strohmeyer's father invited them to spend the weekend with him gambling in Vegas. Um, Strohmeyer grabs a seven-year-old girl named Sharice Iverson, grabs her, takes her into the bathroom, takes her into a stall in the bathroom, closes the door. Cash follows Strohmeyer, goes to the stall next to where Strohmeyer is. Cash stands in the toilet seat, looks over into the stall, 
and sees Strohmeyer raping this girl. Cash says to Strohmeyer, dude, what are you doing? Strohmeyer says, don't worry about it. What does Cash do? He leaves the bathroom. He waits outside um, in the casino. Um, after a few minutes, Strohmeyer comes out without the girl. Cash says to Strohmeyer, what'd you do? Where is she? Strohmeyer says, I raped her, strangled her, murdered her. Strohmeyer is sentenced to life imprisonment because he pled guilty. There's not, death penalty is not imposed on him. Cash. Cash is a bystander, 100%. Did Cash did, did, uh, did go to the police and said, hey, this mate of mine, he just... Uh... He didn't do anything. Cash is not prosecuted. Cash goes to the University of California, Berkeley. His classes are boycotted. There are demonstrations against him. Uh, he's interviewed on 60 Minutes by Ed Bradley, and Ed Bradley says, like, what were you thinking? And Cash says, hey, I didn't know her. I owed her no duty. That's a bystander who is a absolute, for me, has committed clearly the crime of non-intervention. That's I wonder, do you know anything about the legal situation in Holland? It seems yeah, to I, be well, that. Yes, and so I'll get there in Holland in All half right. a second. Um, the second story is a couple of years ago um, at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, um, um, a football player whose name is Vandenberg has a girlfriend, on-off girlfriend. They, she gets drunk. He brings her back to the dorm room. She's unconscious. He texts his friends telling them to come over. Um, I apologize for the language. He texts them, she's here, she's free, she's available, she's yours. Two guys come over. He sodomizes her and they rape her. She's unconscious. On the up, the he, Vandenberg, it's a bunk bed. Vandenberg's bed is down here, and sleeping on the up on the upper bunk is a guy named Prelo, who's also a football player. Everybody here's a football player, so you know these are big, you know, okay, alpha males. Prelo, Vandenberg is shaking him, um, saying to Prelo, "Hey, wake up, she's here. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do to her." Prelo feigns sleeping, um, and I quote, because it made him uncomfortable. In the middle of the night, he gets up from his bunk bed, comes down to the floor, sees her. She has, she's unconscious, she's vomited, she's in a terrible situation. He looks at her and goes to sleep in another dorm room. Absolute bystander. Um, Vandenberg goes to, is, was convicted, I think, 25 years in jail, and the other guys were also convicted. Prelo, like Cash, not prosecuted, not convicted, because both in Tennessee, and in, in Nevada, there's no bystander legislation. Um, here in Holland, as I looked into this, mm -hmm. and I, having met with, with, with um, attorneys and law professors here in Holland, there's been one case here in Holland where a bystander was convicted, but the, the facts are so complicated and so specific that I don't think you can really, you can draw anything. Um, you can generalize that's the exactly situation, right. yeah. One of the things that, I, that I'm, um, pleased with is that it appears to be the case that um, in Utah, in the next legislative session, a member of the Utah legislator, a member of the Utah state legislature will introduce legislation based- Utah is the state where you're living. Right, where right, I teach in the University of Utah, will introduce legislation based on the book. Really? Yes. There are four states that have bystander legislation and, mm. and his bill is a, is a compromise reflection of, you know, mixing and matching. That's what politics is, our compromise. He talked about, he talked about it with you. Oh yeah, we've met a number of times. And absolutely, he's read the book. Um, and he, um, what he told me, he is now convinced that this is indeed a necessary, you know, that for me is what I call it an un, un, unintended Marvelous. consequence, yes, but something that yes, delights yes. me enormously. Yes, of course. I mean, it's nice to write a book, uh -huh, uh, but you also know this, <laughs> but you also want the thing to have consequences. Change, yes. yes, exactly right. Oh. Well, that's the good news. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Um, and, it, I, you know, a book like this, and I'm well aware of this, um, having now given book talks throughout the United States, what, interest, what I find to be, I don't know if interesting is the good word, is the range of ages of people who come to book talks. I thought it would be people, you know, plus minus our generation. Um, in the book talks that I've given, um, there indeed are the 85-year-olds, right? Um, but what's really, I find, um, rewarding are kids in middle school, 14, 13, 12. Um, and they are compelled to come to your lectures? Not they? at all. Um, 
And in one of the talks I gave, it was clear that the where the talk was, the kid didn't walk there. The kid had, you know, said to mom or dad, I want to go to this. And then it was really interesting when the talk was over, um, the kid very politely came up to me, and he, um, bought a copy of the book, uh, wanted me to sign it. And I said, I've got to ask you, how old are you? Um, she was 13. And I said, I, <coughs> and this, I told her, this is not an easy read. Um, no. It really is not an easy read. It's not a fun read. Um, she said, but after her listening to the talk, the book talk I gave, um, she decided that she wanted to read the book. I also said to her, I think it's terrific that you came, actually heard the talk, not an easy talk. Um, but that, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect middle-aged school mm -hmm. kids to, talk, to come out. And, and, and she was Jewish or not? No, no, not, no, no, no just, not at all. No, no. Not at all. The audiences have been... Um, name a religion, they're come, name a, mm -hmm. uh, of whatever ethnic group. It's been across the board. And I then what's really, not interesting, I don't like the word, but more often than not, I, after book talks, I wake up the next morning and I have emails waiting for me from people who came to the talk, sharing with me their personal stories where they either mm -hmm. did or did mm -hmm. not act on behalf of individuals in peril. I've gotten um, these very moving uh, emails from children of Holocaust survivors who then share with me pic their, fa their family pictures. Um, and if a book like this enables or opens up, enables people to talk about um, dark chapters in their lives, then I, the only word I can think of is somewhere between being, it's rewarding mm -hmm. and it's very humbling. I didn't expect that. No, 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 neither did I, the way you describe the audience and then the people reacting to you. Yes, more than rewarding, I would say, because it's a very important uh, topic, of course. Well, of that's interesting because I, when when you know, in the, particularly in the states, when reporters interview me about the book, uh, and I understand why, but they're trying to draw me into this conversation about where in the America of today, whether people are complicit in terms of what's happening in American politics at the moment. Complicit of Trump. That's right, <laughs> and I. I, I, I don't, it's an interesting question. I understand, I understand where the question comes from. Um, and my response to, to reporters and others who ask me the same, that question, and I understand the question, is I think you, you have two duties. One is to go vote, all right? And two is clearly to be involved in politics. But the question about the larger complicity of society in terms of what's happening in America today, that's, I, I leave to others. Um, but for me, in the same way that the Syrian question, right? Are we complicit in that? No. For me, what's really essential is, is how each and every one of us sees our role, not in larger society, but the duty owe you to me and me to you. That's at the end of the day what this book is. Assuming that we are both the same, because at the beginning of your story, you described these uh, villages. And that reminded me of discussions I had in Stalingrad. It's now called mm. Volgograd. I was with a group of Germans who were mm. looking for the graves of their, their family parents. members. Yeah. And of course, the uh, well, I forced them uh, onto the conversation of the Holocaust. I said, uh, I see this monument, and I was looking for uh, <coughs> names. My name is there, Mol, double L. But I can't find the name of my wife. Uh, my wife is Jewish. I see no Jewish names, no Cohens, no, mm. and they could see them the body shifting. Language, right? And uh, no, they didn't like that, <laughs> the way I was turning the conversation. And then one of them, he was, a, what do you call it, a parson? He was some clerical, he had some clerical position. Uh, like a pastor or something? Yes. And he said, yes, yes, but you must never forget that what the Germans did, of course, of course. was terrible, terrible. It should never have happened, and it was, uh, well, beyond, beyond words. Uh, but, he said, but they could never have done it without the help of the people. Mm. <coughs> there was a friend who said immediately, Maybe you're right, but it would not have happened had you not come to their countries and uh, in the made first it place. possible in the first place. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> I like that, those, those kind of conversations. But uh, of course, up to a point, he is right. The Germans uh, initiated this 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 uh, this act, but had willing helpers, and more than that, it was uh, sure. <coughs> it was rooted in history. I mean. And the way you describe the, these villages, which is uh, awful, yes. Uh, 
they saw them as not worth of uh, right. human compassion, which is different in your, <coughs> your own society. I, I keep visualizing these people standing on a bridge looking at the drowning child. <coughs> I mean, the human nature is, to, if you see a child in awful distress, I think for most of us, the instinct is to save a child. The last thing you would do is pull out your iPhone and film a drowning child. It's impossible to understand, even to, to, to see it. I mean, I visualize it, but without any understanding. That's exactly right. Uh -uh. Um, and that's why I think that, that um, the book has, has garnered that kind of attention because complicity, it's an uncomfortable topic. Um, I gave a talk last week in Israel and I, and I said to somebody, this is uncomfortable because it requires us all to take a mirror and not to me to look at you, but me to look at me. And that's something that makes people uncomfortable. Um, the whole question of responsibility. The easy answer, um, and I don't know about here in Holland, but as a child growing up in America, the parable is we all know to do the right thing. That's the parable that, we, that, that American kids are raised on. We all know to do the right thing. So if there's one thing I've learned over the course of the past four years is no, we don't. Um, and that's why um, and I understand the discomfort with imposing a legal duty on the bystander. I understand that. On the other hand, I really don't see any alternative because no, we don't know to do the right thing. Yes, some do. Um, here we are in Holland and clearly there were, and I interviewed them, um, Jews who were, who were saved by Gentiles. Um, I've also met with, with Gentiles whose parents made a decision not to save Jews. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've interviewed both sides, um, but that that framing it, whether in religious terms or moral terms or ethical terms, for me misses the point. And for me, it really I view it maybe as a law professor, um, based on my parents' mm -hmm. experiences, yeah. I've come to the clear conclusion um, that even if it makes people uncomfortable, that a legal duty must be imposed on you when I am in distress. You have to be uh, held responsible for your action or your inaction. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Um, not acting is also an action. I mean, it's a con it's a it's a conscious decision to you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting. I um, I found testimony um, from Holocaust survivors who um, it's interesting you do this who who describe the the villager the bystander you know turning their head, you know, um, to avoid looking. Mm -hmm. I found um, a letter written by a, um, a woman who lived near the concentration camp, Mauthausen, who wrote a letter to the uh, camp commander, um, I'm paraphrasing, that if he's going to kill people, just he, she has a request, to leave the bodies elsewhere because the, the smell, <laughs> it really is bothering her on her morning walks. <laughs> <coughs> horrible, horrible. You give lectures in Holland too about your book because Holland is uh, so probably... Absolutely, so I am, um, I just finished with the first part of a book tour in the States. Um, I'm now here in Holland and in Germany working on a new book. I will be coming back to Holland um, in May to give talks. Um, and I have found that one of the great things about giving talks, whether in Israel or in the States, and I obviously hope to do so here in Holland, that's why I would um, hope that the book would be published here in the Netherlands, is, you know, at my age, I really don't care if people agree with me or disagree with me. What is important is to have the discussion. And that's why I'm delighted, as I say, to be coming back here in May to give a series of talks. Um, just have the discussion. You have, you have schedules already, you know, where you will be? In, in Maastricht in May. Maastricht in right. May. But not in any other city. I'm happy to, you know, name a place and I'll, <laughs> give me an audience and I'll come speak okay, with them, okay, absolutely. Okay. Well, I attend your uh, lecture anyway. Uh, 
It's a pity we can't go into your next uh, subject because that's also very interesting. Right. It's about um, hate crime. Hate crime. Hate speech, hate crime. It's, uh, I go from happy topic to happy topic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, promise. Well, your your first book was very interesting too about the uh, how can you cope with the freedom from religion. Yes, yes. The okay, you tolerate the intolerance. Exactly yes, right. Yes, exactly right. And this also is a very interesting, very important topic. Well, it's a pity. I would like to go into your well next your time. Next, next time. Thank okay. you. Well, Amos, it was a pleasure. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Uh,